So again, I definitely have some options, but there's, there's, there's no silver bullet or magic solution where I can just put in this gateway and everything's going to work. Even a proxy, proxy is a great option, but only where the proxy understands the protocol, right? So for HTTP, that works fairly well. But you know, if I have you know any kind of like um, uh, SIP or video or um, real time chat or XMPP or anything like that, proxies don't support protocols like that. So it only works for simple traffic. So there's, there's really there's there's no easy way to just say I'm going to have this magic gateway that's going to prevent me from having to convert to IPv6. And and because of the scale, it's, it's just not going to happen. <coughs> And then, um, so uh, I want to get a little bit into the weeds on this part. So another question I get is, why, why is this such a pain? You know, when people admitted the internet, why couldn't they make it like the phone number system, right? So if I look, if I look at the phone number system, if I want to like add an area code or change the number of digits, I can do it. Why can't I do that with IP? You know, why is this such a pain? And actually, that, that would again be a whole other talk to explain why that's the case, but that's how it was designed. And the problem is, and anybody who's getting into the SDN space, I've actually seen some really interesting talks about this. The problem is with the abstraction. So when I look at networking, if I have a proper abstraction, when the user talks to the network, they would see like a top level name and they, that would be opaque. They cannot see under the name. If that was how IP was set up, you had to use DNS and the address was hidden from you. So for example, with the file system, right? anybody who writes code, when you write something in Python or Ruby to open a file, do you worry about what kind of file system it is? No. Does it matter if it's Linux or Windows or OS X or Unix or, or real-time operating system? It's all the same because that's hidden. right? I get a file descriptor and the details are abstracted away. And unless I write file systems, I don't care. I write to the file descriptor and it just works. And that's really what we need for IP, but unfortunately we don't have it. With IP, we don't have a good abstraction. Instead, I have a name, but the name passes back the address. So the address is not abstracted away. So that means the application sees and deals with the address. So that means if we change the address at all, we have to change the application. <coughs> There are some exceptions like Java. If you use the Java socket API, it actually abstracts it away. And if you don't do any cute tricks, you just use a standard API, then it just works. But Java is an exception. Most languages, you still deal with the address, and that's that's the problem. That's a big part of why it's so painful. And I wanted to, so I am definitely not an expert coder. I'm, I'm a, a dabbler. But at least I'm hoping this will give you an idea. This is in Python. So this is kind of my classic socket code, right? So I basically. Um, I import my socket library, and then typically I'm going to do a get host by name. So my user is going to pass me a fully qualified domain name, like www.yahoo.com. I pass that to get host by name, and that returns me an IPv4 address. Now that whole call is IPv4 only. It will never work with IPv6. right? Then I basically connect with my socket. I use AFINet, which is IPv4 only, and I connect. And I have, there's no <coughs> code like that. And unfortunately, because the socket API exposes all the low level details, I mean, it's a mixed blessing, but in the case of IPv6, it's mostly bad. That means that potentially I have to go back and recode. That, that's why something like a load balancer is so appealing. <coughs> Using a CDN is so appealing, because then I don't have to touch my apps, usually. Now, if I want to make that dual stack, I don't have to change a lot, but I have to change a little. So the first thing is, Instead of using get host by name, I use get address info. And it's cool, this is pretty universal. Um, Windows, OS X, Linux, I mean, I think across the board, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. I mean, it does vary a little bit by language, but this is pretty close. Python is very close to C, which is where this all came from, in, in terms of the socket API. So, um, now there is a major difference, though. With get host by name, when I do that lookup to resolve the name to an IP, I get one IP back. Okay, but we have a problem. When I have IPv4 and IPv6, and I do a DNS lookup on Yahoo, I'm going to get back IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. So which one do I use first? IPv4 or IPv6? How do I sort those addresses? <coughs> so the, the, the answer
answer is, there's an RFC called, um, I believe, 6724, something like that. It, it basically talks about address selection, right? So I get back a list of addresses. My operating system has what's called a prefix policy table, where, and I can change that, where it sorts the addresses. By default, in all modern operating systems, and this just changed with OS 10.11, it's finally the same there too, it's going to sort them so IPv6 is first, unless I change it. But that means that this get address info is going to return me a list or an array, not just a single address, which means I have to change my code. So notice here, I'm not just doing one connect, I'm doing a for loop and I'm iterating. So in Python, I can just, I don't have to have a count, I can just iterate through a list and it just knows how long it is, right? So I'm iterating through all the elements in that list and trying each one. So this is also a change in your code. So it's not super hard, but, but it is a change, right? And you kind of got to think through, what if it doesn't work? How am I going to react? Okay, so this goes through. Um, I kind of put in a little hack that said AF equals 2, that's IPv4. So I, I kind of I kind of just wanted to do IPv6, so I said, okay, <coughs> IPv4, just give it. Um, but anyway, so basically, you know, standard with any language, I do my try except. So I try and connect, catch the error if it fails. And I basically keep going until I get a connection or until I've iterated through all the addresses. So, um, and then the other thing is, in my socket connection, instead of using AF inet, I use AF unspecified. So it can be V4 or V6. So that's really it, those three things. I, I have to um, change how I look up, I have to iterate through a list, and I have to use AF on specs, right? Or if I'm lucky, it'll be like Java and it's all abstracted away. So it's not a huge change, but it is a change. So ho hopefully, it's a super basic example, but hopefully it helps. Uh, Isn't that time idea. consuming for the program to go checking all these different um, if, I mean, if, if, you only, if the first one works, then it's really no different than IPv4. But you're right. I mean, if, if like two or three of them fail, it can be very time consuming, but that's OS dependent. So usually, like, uh, I, you know, usually if I were writing uh, a client, you know, what I would do is I would probably set a timer, right? So if, when I'm at my socket call, I can say, like, okay, I'm going to try a connection, I'm going to wait, like, you know, 300 milliseconds. And if you don't come back in 300 milliseconds, I'm going to throw it away and try the next one. Right? Because the, some operating systems might take minutes to time out, and your user's never going to wait for minutes. So usually when you, when you do the socket, you basically set a timeout that says, I'm only going to wait this long. But again, in IPv4, it's the same thing. I, this, this get host by name, it only returns one address, but it's just picking a random address. So if Yahoo sends you back like five IPv4 addresses, it just picks one to give it to you. But it might fail. So that, that part doesn't really change. Um, however, it, it is a good question in the sense that if I look at reliability, the average failure for IPv4 is like, um, I think it's like 0.8% or 0.08%. I forget, but I, it, it was really small, like, like a fraction of a percent. But the failure rate for IPv6, and a lot of this is because a tunnel is not true native IPv6, is more like 1.8%. So it is higher. So I would say in your code, and this, this is there's something called happy eyeballs, where if you're connecting to V6, you would actually set like a two or 300 millisecond timeout, and if it doesn't come back, just assume it fails and iterate to the next address. But really, I would argue that that's good general practice, because if you have multiple addresses, you should try and connect to each one, and I wouldn't wait more than 300 milliseconds tops, unless it's a satellite connection. The time is now 8.30 and the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 o'clock. Please be advised that the internet will shut down 10 minutes before closing. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but this is from Apple. So Apple's interesting. Um, they're a bit of a trailblazer. Um, so like I said, they've already fully deployed IPv6. And Apple basically said last year with iOS 9, which is already out, if your app does not work in an IPv6 only network, we will not accept it. So they're basically forcing people to test their apps, and your app has to work through NAT64. Um, and what they found is, now another thing, I hear some people <coughs> saying that Apple should support 464 xlink because they, Apple said we're not going to support it. And I've heard a lot of people squawk, oh, you know, they're killing us. But actually, the way Apple solved it is, you only need 464 xlink for an IPv4 only application. But if Apple can say all apps have to support NAT64, you don't need 464 xlink 
right? So keep that in mind too. Um, I like Apple Solutions better. They, they have some gumption to do it. This is basically showing common IPv4 only calls, right? So if you use if you use Swift or um, or Objective C, right, you got to, you have to avoid those calls. Those are IPv4 only calls. And what's also interesting is they found that um, really the big one is get host by name. But they also found that a lot of people check to see if they can reach, if there's a default route where they can reach an IPv4 address. And if, if that check fails, this is called a pre-flight check, it, it basically if it can't connect to an IPv4 default route or a certain IPv4 address, it just assumes that you're not connected to the internet. And then the app fails. So Apple was saying, no, that is bad code. The way you should do it is, just how I described, is basically you should do a connection, you should set a socket timeout for two to 300 milliseconds, and if it doesn't connect, then react appropriately. But you shouldn't try and do a pre-flight check. So I thought it was kind of interesting that they, they scrubbed a lot of code, and these are the general best practices they came back with. So I'll kind of leave that in there as well, reference material. And that's it. So I, I, I rushed you a little, but hopefully, um, I mean, you can see there's a lot of details, but I, I guess what I'm hoping is, I'm hoping that kind of helps give you an idea of where things are at. And maybe enough information so you can kind of think about, is this interesting to me yet? Or maybe when does it get interesting? So any, any questions with that? Gibson? So I did I'm have sorry, a question. You asked, I never no. back to you. Um, so um, it looks like IPv6, you have to go through your ISP to purchase it or do through some kind of elaborate justification. Um, no. You, you typically, it's not a cost. You basically, they're flipping a switch. So no, no. Okay, so I'm saying you have to do, you have to go to ISP and purchase your your IPv6, right? No. Or you have to go. Okay, no, so maybe I should start over. You have you have the option of going to an ISP to get an IPv6. Are you right? talking about the service or the address? So I'm talking about getting a, a service that provides you the address. So okay, you well, have. Let's let's separate them. Okay. So let let's put the address aside. So just the service. You would call the ISP and say, turn on the switch. Okay, so what I'm saying is that's your option, or you could go to the, what is it, CERN or whatever? The, okay, for the, for the address, yes. you can either get it from your ISP, yep. or you can go to Aaron and you can apply for your own independent block. That's okay. optional. All right, so I understand that to, to apply for that, you have to go through a justification. You have to be like a, a business, you have to be doing an experiment, that type of thing. They're not that's just, true, but Aaron, Aaron, if you're, a, if you're a small business, it might be a little tricky, but if you're a sizable business, Aaron doesn't make it that hard. Okay, so for me as an individual, I want to use IPv6. You have to get it from your ISP. Okay, so now I have a problem. I have an ISP that I can use an IPv6 to provide a service. I come to this library, that ISP is not what I'm using to connect. Yeah, so right? if, if you're in an IPv4 only location, you'd have, you'd have to VPN to somewhere that you can get an IPv6 address. So the, for example, um, what is it? Uh, there, there are certain services where if you have an IPv4 only connection, you can actually VPN to an IPv6 pop, and then it's just like a VPN, they'll give you an IPv6 address. So if you're on an IPv4 only connection, you would, you would have to set up a tunnel or a VPN that would give you IPv6 connectivity. Okay, so in the case of having like a Internet of Things, you have a device that you want to connect up, and that device moves from one place to another, connects up to a different type of network based on where it is. The current IPv6 going through an ISP isn't going to really provide the service that you need. You'd have to set up a contract with several different ISPs for each of the different locations that you're going to connect to. I mean, well, so um, I'm not an IoT expert, um, but from, from what I've done, um, my research suggests that if I'm doing IoT, typically what I do is if like, I have some kind of a field sensor, I would contract with, with one of the major carriers, you know, like AT&T, Verizon, or Sprint, or T-Mobile, and say, Okay, here's my product. I'm just like Apple's phone. I'm going to embed the <coughs> chip, and I want you know X bandwidth rate up to this much data, and I'm going to bake it into the product price, and kind of like with the Kindle, yeah. right? If I buy a Kindle, the connectivity is baked in. Um, a lot of the IoT companies that I've read, that's how they're doing it. The service is just baked into the product. So, but but you're, it could it could be a problem. It, it just depends on how you set it up. I mean, if it has to roam between different networks, then you're absolutely right. That, that would be a major problem. So it depends. Yeah, well, I'm just curious if anybody's given thought to how, you know, Internet of Things provided out as, you know, consumable, consumable, you know, from consumers, mm -hmm. 
would be able to connect to all the different ISPs and things. I mean, so we're used to a cell phone, right? The cell phone always connects to the same ISP, right? So you're you're basically locking into an ISP on internet, you know, devices that. Um, that's not that's entirely yeah. true. Yeah. So within so within your native service area, that's true. But if you go out of your native service area, then you roam and you're going through a different provider. Yeah. And, and it works pretty fluidly, even for IPv6 yeah, right now. Yeah. It's like one of the guys at one of the ITF conventions in uh, I think in Singapore. He showed that he had you know T-Mobile USA service. He had an IPv6 address. And he roamed in Singapore and it still worked fine using IPv6. He, with a, with a different provider. Yeah, because uh, T-Mobile USA doesn't exist in Singapore, mm. so he was roaming through a Singapore provider. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to work everywhere, but it's definitely possible. But, but you're right, that, that is absolutely a complex scenario, and you have to carefully think through it. Any, any other questions? Okay. Wow. Thank you, Jim. Great. Great. Thank you.